Hello and welcome to Buddhist Store Global's weekly news highlight. I'm Dr. Justin Whitaker, Senior Correspondent for BDG. This week we highlight the news that the Buddhist scholar Deepak Anand has announced plans to create a Buddhist pilgrimage documentary based on the path of the Buddha and the pilgrim Zhuangzeng's journey journals. We'll look back at recent BDG news and features about Deepak Anand and Buddhist pilgrimage in India. But first, the news. Buddhist scholar and journalist Deepak Anand, who has undertaken a 2200 kilometer overland pilgrimage to retrace the footsteps in India and Nepal of the influential 7th century Chinese Buddhist monk, scholar, and translator Chuanzang, a project known as Retracing Bodhisattva. Chuanzang has announced plans to produce a documentary video series inspired by his travels, which will focus on the sublime wanderings of the historical Buddha Shakyamuni and subsequently by Master Chuanzang. Our proposal is to make a documentary series focusing on the sublime wanderings of the Buddha or Buddha Charika with a new perspective on places, roots, and rituals, as elucidated in the descriptions of the 7th century monk scholar Zhuangzeng. We will divide the Buddha Charaka into 16 thematic stories or episodes Anand shared with Buddhist or Global. Through his own pilgrimage, Anand, a researcher at Nava Nalanda Mahavihara University, has sought to raise awareness of some of the lesser known jewels of India's vast Buddhist heritage, as well as the formidable and far-reaching legacy of Master Xuanzang himself, the influences of which are still felt today. Anand explained that the pilgrimage is currently limited to eight great places associated with the Buddha, Bodhgaya, Kushinagar, Lumbini, Rajgir, Sankhisa, Sarnath, Shravasti, and Vaishali. But the ancient Buddhist literature, especially the travel log of Master Xuanzang, elucidates on a very elaborate Buddhist pilgrimage that include many lesser known places associated with the Buddha and his important disciples. Zhuangzang, who lived from 602 to 664, is widely acknowledged as one of the most illustrious figures in Buddhist history, noted for translating a wealth of Buddhist scriptures from Sanskrit into Chinese and for embarking on a 17-year overland pilgrimage from China to India, which also took him to what is now Bangladesh, Nepal, and Pakistan, where he lived for more than 13 years. Zhuangzang's time in India included five years at the ancient monastic University of Nalanda, a great center for Buddhist learning, where he acquired knowledge of Sanskrit, Buddhist philosophy, and Indian thought. While the majority of Zhuangzang's sojourn in India was spent at Nalanda, he traveled widely, visiting every known sacred site connected with the life of the Buddha. It is this aspect of mas the master's legacy that Deepak has highlighted and replicated seeking out sacred sites and historic relics spread across some 15 Indian states. Anand's journey to explore the sublime footsteps of the Buddha across Indo-Gangetic plains is based on fresh interpretations of the travel accounts of Master Zhuangzang. The journey began in February 2020 and has to date spanned 2200 kilometers. The proposed documentary series aims to promote both historical and cultural aspects from both Buddhism and Chinese-Indian relations, including a showcase of Master Xuanzang's elaborate pilgrimage, including lesser-known Buddhist shrines in the vicinity of the principal shrines of the Eight Great Places, details of the contributions of the Emperor Ashoka and subsequent kings in the development of the Buddhist pilgrimage. Next, a showcase of Master Xuanzang's travel log as a key document for preserving the sacred geography of the footsteps of the Buddha in the Indo-Gangetic Plains. And finally, a showcase of the potential walking pilgrimage trails connecting Buddhist sites and shrines identified during the Retracing Bodhisattva Xuanzang project. 
Last year, BDG's senior editor Craig Lewis wrote in depth about Deepak Anand's journey, covering his planning, his work with Indian officials, including Prime Minister Narendra Modi, and his early journeys. Also writing about Narendra Modi, BDG senior writer Raymond Lamb discussed the Trengseng Memorial in Nalanda, India in 2017, examining the complex history of Sino-Indian relations as they involve Buddhism's long past, present, and future. Lamb writes that, herein lies the potential core of Sino-Indian harmony via Buddhism. How can we celebrate this shared past and the religious exchanges that have had an effect on both nations? How can we celebrate each other's Buddhist heroes, especially those who crossed the Sino-Indian border? How did they influence modern Chinese and modern Indian Buddhism? Perhaps there should be more memorials built or exhibits organized around these early religious and political exchanges. These might be seen as mere gestures, but at the cultural level, they offer recognition of both the religious heritage of both nations and of the religious bond that is shared. You can find more about these BDG news and feature articles covering Deepak Anand and Chuangzang's journey in India in the video description. Let us know what you think about the importance of Chuangzang's place in Buddhist history and future Sino-Indian relations in the comments below. And as always, be sure to check out our website, BuddhistStore.net, for more on this story, as well as other news and features about Buddhism around the world. Well, I'd like to welcome the listeners for tonight's talk, The Great Renunciations of Siddhartha and Maha Pajapati Gautami by Deepak Anand. This talk is organized by the Buddhist Jam Fellowship under the Discovery Talk series, and I'm Dr. Victor Wee, your host. Now, two great renunciations had shaped the Buddhist world, and both of which started from Kapilavastu, the capital city of the Sakyas. I will just cover uh, very quickly uh, the two renunciations. The first, that of Prince Siddhartha, who renounced the world at the age of 29 when he discovered that he had been trapped in a gilded cage of palace life with no likelihood of finding the answers to the universal questions that binds all beings to the cycle of birth and death. He had witnessed the four sides during his city tour and was deeply moved by a sense of helplessness and despair. And there seems to be no way out of sickness, old age and death that everyone seems to be resigned to. His renunciation was unprecedented. He left his princely life in the prime of life and wandered out as a homeless Ramana depending on arms food from day to day. No longer would he have the comfort, the luxury and security of palace life. If he did not receive any offer of shelter, he might have to spend the night sleeping on the cold forest ground under the, uh, under the foot of a tree. If he did not receive arms food, he would have to go hungry. He renounced the world not for his own sake, but for all humanity to find a way out of universal suffering. So one night he rode out on his horse Kantaka out of Kapilavastu's uh, city Eastgate on a moonless night. And he was accompanied by Chana, his charioteer. Now, according to accounts, he rode across until he reached the Anoma River and he crossed the Anoma River on the other side of the river, he cut his hair and exchanged his princely garb with that of a hunter. His search for enlightenment will take him six years of wandering in the gigantic plain before he gained liberation under the Bodhi tree at Budgaya at the age of 35. The enlightenment was epoch making. That was the starting point of his 45 years of mission, 
that gave rise to the Buddha Dharma, the monastic Sangha, and Buddhism that we follow and practice. Now, in the case of Mahaprajapatigotami, that was the second great renunciation. Mahaprajapatigotami was the younger sister of Queen Mahamaya, who died seven days after giving birth to the prince. She was also married to King Suddhodana and was like a mother to the prince. After the king died, Mahaprajapati Gotami, who had heard the Buddha Dhamma as being delivered by the Buddha, felt that there was nothing to hold her back from renouncing her royal life to adopt a spiritual life of a nun. Now, the process to get the Buddhas to approve nun's ordination was not an easy one. The Buddha had visited Kapilavastu when King Suddhodana was passing away, and the Buddha was there when the king died. Now, after the king has passed away, Prajapati Gotami, together with the Sakyan women, visited the Buddha to ask for ordination. At first, that might sound like a bizarre or a crazy request, because the request was unheard of and completely contrary to the Indian norms and conventions during that time. Besides, the nun's life could be in danger, because ordained women lived, living under the life of a sramana were unprotected by their family members, and they're subjected to many types of dangers, including sexual assault and abduction. Three times, Mahapajapatami Gotami uh, requested for ordination, and three times the Buddha refused. Pajapati was deeply disappointed, but she was not deterred. The Buddha stayed at Kapilavastu for some time, and after that, left with the monks for Vishali on foot. It was a long journey that took many days. But Mahaprajapati Gotami was not about to abandon her quest to be a nun. She shaved her hair, wore saffron robes, and walked from Kapilavastu to Vishali with half 500 Sakin women to follow the Buddha. It was a difficult journey for palace women who had to walk barefooted across forests and flooded paths, cut by thorns and brambles, exposed to wild animals, snakes and insects, crossing rivers and streams, and taking food and shelter offered by the villagers. When they finally arrived at, arrived at Vishali, the women stood outside the great hall where the Buddha was resting. They were tired and their feet were swollen after the long journey, and they felt dejected and tears were running their cheeks because they might have to return to Kapilavastu empty-handed. When Venerable Ananda saw the state that the women were in, he was shocked. He asked Pajapati, why was she there? And she explained that the Sakin woman had come all the way from Kapilavastu to seek ordination because they were turned down three times. They had a glimmer of hope that somehow the Buddha might take pity on them and accede to their request, but the Blessed One might say no again. Ananda's heart melted, especially after seeing Prajapati Gotami, who had looked after the Buddha when he was a boy, when he was a baby and when he was a boy. She was like a mother to the prince and even breastfed him when he was a baby. Her own baby was looked after by a wet nurse. So Ananda approached the Buddha and made a request for ordination on behalf of the women. And again, the Buddha had to turn down the request. Now, Ananda had been high on his emotional intelligence. So he decided to take the issue by approaching it from a different angle. He asked the Buddha, Venerable Sir, is it possible for women to renounce the world according to the teaching and to the Vinaya? and realize the fruits of Sotapati, or Sakadagami, or Anagami, or even attain sanctification. And the Buddha says, yes, Ananda, a woman is capable of realizing all these four fruits. Then Ananda said, Venerable Sir, Mahaprajapati Gotami was a great benefactress to you. She was a sister to your mother. She brought you up. She breastfed you from the time of the death of your mother. Now, 
if a woman is capable of realizing the fruits of sanctification, it must be Prajapatikotami. It is only proper that she should be permitted to renounce the world and receive ordination. And the Buddha finally relented and agreed to the ordination of the women into the order with some conditions attached. So Ananda repeated the rules to Mahapajapati and asked whether she was prepared to abide by these rules. To this, Prajapati says, oh, she would gladly accept them and she will abide them and will not transgress them until the end of her life. So there you have it. Two great renunciations, both originating from Kapilavastu. One led to the birth of Buddhism and the other to the start of the Bhikkhuni Sangha. Now, what is the significance of this topic? The current Buddhist pilgrimage circuit is based on four holy places and four sites of miracles. But when you examine the travel accounts of Fa Xian and Xuanzang, you will be impressed by the rich cultural and archaeological legacy left in the records. Xuanzang's accounts are far more detailed than Fa Xian. And he gave a detailed account in terms of the direction, the distance, and also the description of the place and its significance. So when Swenton was in India, he made a point to visit every place connected with the Buddha. So it has been an exhaustive record of all these places. There were two invaluable records connected with Swenton. One is called the Great Tang Record of the Western Regions. And this was authored by Xuan Tang himself for Emperor Taizong of the Tang Dynasty. And the second reference is called a biography of the Tripitaka Master of the Great Xi'an Monastery of the Great Tang Dynasty. And this was authored by the disciples of Xuan Tang, Hui Li and Shi uh, Yanzong. So they put together, and I'm sure Xuan Tang will leading the, uh, the uh, translation exercise in Xi'an. Uh, in order, in the breaks, he will have uh, mentioned to, to the, his disciples uh, his journey, and they have made notes of this. And this is also an invaluable um, collection of records on the, the journey that was made by Xuan Tang. Now, the British and Indian archaeologists have used these records to uncover the Buddhist holy places during the 19th century. But there were more sites that were mentioned by Xuan Tang that has not been identified. These sites were lost to the jungle or repurposed for other uses, and the size and significance had disappeared from human memory because Buddhism disappeared from India since the 12th to the 13th century. There were no Buddhists left to visit these places for the last 600 to 700 years. Now, what has made the difference this time? Uh, was that our speaker tonight, Deepak Anand, was connected with the research work of Xuan Zhang when he was working at the Navan Nalanda Mahavihara. The research team managed to identify the place names of the 7th century to the current names, to the present names. And they have taken a step further. They make use of the Geographic Information System, or GIS technology, and try to identify the places mentioned with real locations on the map using the directions and the approximate distances mentioned by Xuan Zhang. If Xuan Zhang was accurate, you can actually find stupas, pillars, and monasteries at the places identified on the GIS map. So the results are actually revealing. Now, on the 10th of August, uh, Last year, Deepak gave us a talk on where the Buddha cut his hair. Deepak identified the Anoma River that forms the boundary between Nepal and India. And going by Xuan Zhang's records, there should actually be two stupas on the Indian side of the river in order to mark the site where the Buddha cut his hair and another one where the Buddha exchanged his royal clothings with, that, with those of the hunter. Now, in his talk, Deepak only found one stupa but he was confident of finding the second one close by. Since he could not cross into Nepal because of COVID reasons, he decided to go on the trail again in July this year. 
starting from Tilara Court, which is Kapilavastu on the Nepal side. And he crossed the Anoma River again. And what did he find? Yes, there was a second stupa as recorded by Xuanzang. When the directions are mapped out using the GIS system, they have great predictive ability. You can actually find the places mentioned. Therefore, giving us confidence on the precision of Sun Chang's records and the accuracy of the GIS maps. Now, just a little bit on the Deepak. Deepak Anand is a Buddhist pilgrimage explorer and a writer passionate about the revival of ancient Buddhist pilgrimage in India. This is the fourth talk that he has given that was hosted by BGF. He has now a big following, not only in Malaysia and Singapore, but also internationally. And this talk is also cross broadcast in India, uh, radio tourism in Nepal, as well as the World Fellowship of Buddhist Years. He had, in fact, been working on Buddhist heritage since 2005 and published books and articles on Buddhist heritage, including Sun Chang's journey uh, that could be used to revitalize the ancient Buddhist pilgrimage in India. Since February 2020, Deepak has walked 2,200 kilometers on foot to retrace uh, Sun Chang's route in India. And his travels are all uh, documented in his blog, and you should follow this. It is called Nalanda Insatiable Offering. That's his blog, all right? And he hopes to get sponsorship for this production of the documentary videos of, that is following Sun Chang's trail that was made 1,400 years ago. So with that introduction, uh, Deepak, welcome uh, to the talk and uh, uh, please take over. Thank you, Dr. V. Thanks a lot. Good evening to all the viewers. So thanks for the wonderful introduction. And uh, uh, you have uh, already briefed about, you know, you have given a detailed description about the two great enunciations. So I should just start with, uh, uh, I will just start with, uh, you know, my journey. Yeah, so here it is. So basically, you know, we all talk about uh, the renunciation of Bodhisattva Siddhartha. We just talk about the great renunciation, but uh, after reading the Buddhist literature, I realized not just uh, the uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha's uh, uh, renunciation, but renunciation of Mahapajapati Gautami and 500 Shrakyan women. Uh, it was equally great and inspiring. So uh, as Dr. V has already given the introduction about you know, the renunciation of Bodhisattva Siddhartha and uh, this uh, story of Bodhisattva Siddhartha's renunciation is very popular in Buddhist literature. You will find uh, this story with great details in uh, all the text. Uh, so this is the trail of, according to Buddhist text, this was the trail of Bodhisattva Siddhartha uh, in his renunciation. So he left Kapilavastu Palace City which is present day Tilara Kota. And from there, he went to Ramagrama. From Ramagrama, he reached Anoma River. He crossed Anoma and then he reached Vaishali. And from Vaishali, he went to Rajgrah. And then from Rajgrah, he, he reached Uruvela. And this is the place where Uruvela is the place where he practiced for more than five years. And ultimately, he attained enlightenment and became Buddha. So this is the trail according to uh, Buddhist literature about the uh, renunciation trail of Bodhisattva Siddhartha. And another renunciation that uh, uh, Dr. V has uh, given a detailed description about was the renunciation of Mahapajapati Gautami and 500 Shakyan women. So basically, Buddhist literature doesn't mention much about much about the trail, entire trail. You know, for, for what are the places which this woman they crossed, they they, they traveled, uh, the places which they touched. But basically, this all this literature they mentioned that uh, they were basically following Buddha because. Uh, for fifth year after the enlightenment and 11 year after the renunciation of Bodhisattva Siddhartha, when Buddha was uh, in Kapilavastu uh, to resolve a dispute between Kolians and Shakyans regarding this water sharing. So when he arrived Kapilavastu, so after giving talks and, and I mean, when he was about to leave, I mean, when he was there, so Mahapajapati got me, met uh, Buddha and uh, asked to be accepted as a nun. Uh, about herself and other uh, Shakyan uh, women. But then as uh, the literature goes, uh, Buddha denied this. Uh, he didn't allow, he, did, he find, I mean, he, he didn't, uh, he, 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 he thought, thought that, I mean, probably this was not the right time. 
so i mean this girls they all got collected and then they thought of like you know they decided to go to vishali and uh, put their case again to buddha and uh, so basically buddhist literature says that they they left kapilavastu for vishali but they do not mention about the places which they touched but uh, all the buddhist literature they mention they followed uh, immediately after buddha left so after a couple of weeks i mean maybe after a couple of days or uh, one or two week they started following the trail of uh, they started following the buddha and uh, sangha so basically they took the same trail which was taken by uh, uh, buddha and sangha uh, that is i mean the same trail of kapilavastu rama grama and anuman uh, reaching to vaishali so this is my trail my food journey trail which i started from uh, uh, adi badri in haryana on 20th february to 2020 so walking it was i mean when i reached uh, after walking 500 km when i reached sankisa in march so there was a lockdown for two months so i stayed here for two months and then after that i resumed my food journey on may 18 and uh, when i then uh, after one month i arrived at piprahava that is the indian part of the kapilavastu indian side of kapilavastu kapilavastu is an empire which is now like divided by border so we have like you know indian border uh, half a part of kapilavastu is on the indian side and a part of kapilavastu is in nepal side so uh, i was not allowed to enter nepal because there was uh, because of covid lockdown uh, i was not allowed to enter uh, nepal so what i did i mean this is like you know this is piprava and this is uh, lumbini and this is kapilavastu so and this is like you know up to here it is nepal and then then i i i i, I could not do, do this part so i resumed my food journey from this part and then i finished the entire trail later so again i tried to enter this year but again this was uh, this year also there was i mean when i went there on J july 22 it was again there was a lockdown i mean there was still i mean like no there was no lockdown but i mean borders were still closed i mean they were not allow anybody to cross the border and uh, enter i mean people nepal people from nepal were not allowed to enter india and indian were not allowed to enter nepal but uh, uh, but you know the borders were still closed this is aligarhwa border uh, which is connection between piprava and uh, lumbini and piprava and kapilavastu uh, piprava and tilarkot so this border was closed so with help of some people I, i i sneaked into nepal i mean this is i mean a uh, different route through the jungles and through agriculture farms i sneaked into uh, nepal and uh, on the other side of uh, nepal i was welcomed by vikram uh, ji my friend and my mentor i mean uh, a senior person who, who has helped me a lot in uh, conceiving this food journey in nepal and this is Kapil, young people from uh, kapilavastu tourism this is an ngo which is uh, active in uh, kapilavastu area to, for promotion of buddhist pilgrimage in, in the kapilavastu and around so they welcomed me uh, so after that uh, uh, basically why i choose to enter nepal on july 22 because july 23rd was ashad purnima ashad full moon day and uh, this is the day when bodhisattva siddhartha he did the great renunciation so uh, on in kapilavastu in in, in tilarakota Uh, there's a team I mean, led by vikram ji they every year uh, they are, they organize this event maha avishkramana so this event is basically celebration of this great renunciation of bodhisattva siddhartha so what happens on that day is like you know the important people and venerable monks and local community they all all of them they get collected uh, in the uh, in the late evening and at the midnight what they do is like you know uh, they they reenact the uh they reenact uh, the event which took place uh, uh, which buddha i mean bodhisattva siddhartha did so there was an a horse and this this is a guy i mean dressed as bodhisattva siddhartha and he uh, exits this eastern gate of uh, tilarkot kapilavastu palace city so i witnessed this event i was there and after this event was over i resumed my food journey just like as uh, bodhisattva siddhartha did 2600 years ago in the middle of night he sneaked out of the palace so i also did the same uh, in the middle of night uh, of ashad purnima uh, i was provided with a uh, a co walker a partner uh, who was uh, to walk with me in the entire nepal stretch of my food journey so uh, lumini development trust provided me Uh, this co partner the co walk uh, walker and uh, so this is i mean like you know, i spent some considerable time with uh, this young team of uh, kapilavastu tourism these guys i mean they are 
uh, I, I really appreciate their efforts. Uh, they have come together uh, to promote uh, the Buddhist heritage in uh, uh, this lesser known places in around uh, uh, Tilar Court. And uh, they are guided by uh, Bikramji. So uh, this is like, you know, this is Piprava. So this is like, you know, 19 kilometer stretch uh, from Piprava to Tilara Court. So I started my food journey from Piprava I, 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 on 22nd. And then I reached here on 23rd. I started my this uh, great initiation trail following the footsteps of Bodhisattva Siddhartha and Mahaprajapati got me. So middle of uh, a short Punima night, I started from here. So my first halt was Lumbini. And from Lumbini, I went to Bhairava. And from Bhairava, I went to Ramagrama. And from Ramagrama, I went to, I mean, this is like, you know, uh, Anoma River. I mean, Anoma means present day Gandak and uh, in Nepal, they call it Narayani. But now it is uh, almost established that this is ancient Anoma River. So this is my uh, five day travel. Uh, this is what I traveled in five days in Nepal. So his uh, Chandra, he's my walking partner and uh, he's a very good walker. I mean, I had a wonderful time with him. Uh, so my first halt was in Lumbini. Uh, so I, as all of us are aware of this fact that Lumini is the place where uh, Buddha was born. And this place was again uh, identified. I mean, though this Ashokan pillar, it has an inscription about uh, uh, Ashoka's uh, installing. I mean, Ashoka coming to this place and worshipping. And this place mentions about uh, that, that this place is Lumini, birthplace of Buddha. But there were there are many other shrines which were discovered. That this uh, this were known. Their significance was known because of the travel logs of Fashir and Shrinzam. So from Lumbini, Lumbini again. I mean, it was a lockdown time. I mean, it, this uh, main shrine was closed. For, from there, uh, the next day, uh, I crossed Rohini River. All of us uh, are aware about Rohini River. It has uh, it was the border between. Uh, Shakya and uh, Kolia Empire. Buddha's mother, I mean, Mahamaya and uh, his foster mother, Mahaprajapati Gautmi, both of them belong to Kolia Empire, K K Kolia Kingdom. So, Rohani River is the border between these two kingdoms. I crossed this uh, place in the, in like, you know, very early in the morning because, I mean, still in the July, it was very warm. So, me and my partner, Chandra, we decided to walk in like, you know, we started, very, we, we used to start very early in the morning, like 2.30 or 3 every day. So we crossed uh, this place uh, at around like, you know, four so that we can see the picture is very dark. So this is Rohini River and Rohini River is also very important because this is the place where uh, when this Kolia people and Shakya people, they, they were fighting for uh, water sharing uh, for uh, irrigation purpose. So, I mean, this fight became really very serious. So Buddha had to come and intervene. So Buddha gave talks here and it was after this talk that 500 uh, uh, Shakyan and Kolian people, uh, they decided to do, join Sangha. So in that context, this Rohini River is very important. I mean, it's also like, you know, a uh, place of significance. And from there, we reached Ramagrama Relic Stupa. Again, I mean, uh, as uh, Dr. V was talking, uh, the importance of Shrenzang. Uh, this site was dis uh, discovered on the basis of uh, uh, Shrenzang description. And uh, it was it was discovered by Dr. William Ho Hoey in 1899. So uh, the, Nep the Lumni Development Trust they have not uh, excavated Lumni uh, this Nepal government they have not excavated this site, and they have done uh, non-destructive geophysical study, and based on this study have they have found that uh, the stupa is very ancient, probably from Mauryan period. Uh, so I mean, still we do not have any inscription, but only thing which says which convinces us that this is uh, this is rama grama relic stupa is description of shrenzang and uh, another monk scholar fashian their description is so exact so i mean the, so i mean this is the importance of description of shrenzang and fashian that they are so convincing and so accurate that uh, we are convinced that this place is rama grama stupa because shrenzang says so and uh, Another text which talks about uh, Buddha crossing uh, Rama Grama in, in his great renunciation uh, journey is Mahabhishkramana Sutra. So Mahabhishkramana Sutra says that uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha in his overnight journey from, uh, from uh, Palace City 
the kapil vastu to anuma river he crossed rama grama so yeah so this is my like you know uh, shrenzang this is a description of shrenzang shrenzang says uh, the rama grama was like 500 leaf east from uh, tilara court so 500 leaf is something like you know uh, 150 kilometers but it is not uh, it is like only uh, 70 kilometers but this is shrenzang's another description says that uh, the rama grama is 200 leaf from uh, lumini so it fits that description it is like you know from lumini it is for 44 45 kilometers and it is like you know because in last uh, because at the time of shrenzang this was very dense forest and it was not like you know unlike now uh, we didn't had very smooth roads so maybe shrenzang thought i mean he must have taken a long time to travel from lumini to rama grama so that's why he has given description i mean in his description he says it is 200 li which comes something around 60 km so it's now it's like you know for 45 km so it's like you know in uh, in acceptable range but my focus was uh, like you know uh, from rama grama how did uh, bodhisattva siddhartha what was the route taken by bodhisattva siddhartha from rama grama because from rama grama he reached uh, anuma river and uh, this place was totally unexplored i mean nothing is mentioned about i mean uh, uh, what route he took from rama grama no problem, no study has been done on this uh, and uh, the place where bodhisattva siddhartha arrived i mean after crossing anuma and then he cut his hair and then he sent his uh, chandaka back and then he accepted ropes from hunter so based on my study i th- i was sure that this place should be somewhere here but then what was the route i mean uh, how, how can we be sure that uh, this is the place which was which i discovered in uh, my like you know f- uh, in july uh, last year uh, july 2020 so i just wanted to in, in this food journey i wanted to explore this part rama grama to this part i wanted to meet people and talk to them uh, what was what, what was the ancient route connecting these two places how these people i mean in 100 years ago how they traveled from rama grama people who desired to cross uh, anuma river and reach indian part i mean like you know india valmiki nagar area so what was the uh, route and road taken by them so uh, i gave lots of emphasis on my this uh, part of uh, journey so on this journey i met many people i mean like you know these are the people whom i met on my this uh, from rama grama to uh, anuma stretch and i i try to understand i mean how they travel now and how they used to travel i mean what their forefather told about i mean uh, how they they used to travel to india in uh, before i mean we have before this uh, this modern modern roads that we have now so all of them uh, like you know these are two people who were uh, i met uh, something like you know some somewhere in between uh, rama grama and anuma river and uh, this is guy i, I met upendra ji at uh, rama grama ujaini village and uh, i met few boatsmen who were there i mean at anuma river so i had uh, very detailed description with them and uh, village near anuma river so and particularly this lady you know this old lady she was 75 year old and she had a very great she had a very great information about uh, ancient uh, way how people used to cross in ancient time just 50 years or 100 years ago how people used to cross on the other side so based on the, their discussion uh, i i realized i mean i found that uh, uh, this, this 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 is anuma this this is uh, you know gandak river ancient anuma so this is uh, the foothills of himalaya and this is the last range of himalayas so all the streams um, there are many streams which get collected here and from here they make a main stream which becomes gandak so i mean earlier days what uh, i mean this river when it used to exit this uh, mountains it it used to spread in a very large area i mean it used to spread in a very large area i mean you can see so this is this is all ancient river bed and this is a again a map uh, from like 1920s and you can see now the river bed is only this much but in ancient times like you know you can see this is another major stream and this is like you know another stream so now only this stream is existing you know only this stream is presently active and uh, this trip because you know what happened in 1960s they have created a dam here they have created a barrage 
this is the barrage which they have created in 1960s to channelize all the streams all the water they have uh, they, they channelized all the water so this entire river bed i mean this ancient river bed it is now like you know it has this river bed which is like you know ancient river bed so it has all dried up so now only this is active so when i spoke to the, the all the people whom i met they said that uh, uh, in earlier times because water used to spread in large area the river was not very deep and you know only during the monsoons only when there was uh, when there were there used to rain there used to be like you know some more water in the river otherwise throughout the year people can walk and cross the river on their foot uh, it doesn't needs any bore i mean it didn't uh, still i mean in during uh, summer days i mean for more than 6 or 7 months people can actually walk and cross this river even now i mean like you know so in ancient times this river was easily negotiable i mean you don't have to in ancient times uh, a bullock cart could easily cross because this river bed all the water is to spread in this large area so water is to be not very deep so bullock cart and uh, all this uh, people is to walk and cross and still like you know in the months of summers and major part of the year uh, it's only dangerous they say i mean like you know this is when i was there this was the like you know water because i was there in july it was monsoon time so they say the uh, this river is very like you know it flows from bank to bank and a lots of water is there and it's only during the monsoon times when there is flood otherwise i mean even nowadays uh, after monsoon is over one can actually walk and cross this river so in ancient times i think uh, bodhisattva siddhartha he must have crossed this river sitting on his horse uh, and uh, mahaprajapati got me and 500 shakin women maybe they have they might, they might have crossed on foot or maybe they might have used boat for a small part like you know some small section they might have used uh, boat otherwise this whole stretch must be like you know dense forest i mean like you know tall elephant grasses like i have seen such kind of stretches still i mean like you know these are tall elephant grasses and narrow lanes so still this area uh, still uh, this area is uh, like you know after government created this uh, after the government created this barrage and dam so all this got dried up so now earlier it it was very dense forest but now this place is full of uh, villages so in last 50 years what has happened people from this part Uh, like you know indian part and some people from like you know this part they have come and they have they have started living here so now this place which was like you know 100 years ago ago which was like you know dense forest and uh, non negotiable i mean like you know for, in during rainy season full of water and uh, not conducive to stay and live to to make houses but now because of this uh, uh, dam uh, this has all dried up and we have lots of villages here when i spoke to people they said uh, that uh, the, the, this, there was an ancient route from here rama grama and uh, to this place which is they called thari ghat and this according to all of them this thari ghat is very ancient and uh, uh, still like you know i mean 100 even 50 years ago 100 years ago bullock cart used to cross i mean all the people coming from this side this area who, who would want to cross and enter india this side they would always use this thari ghat so thari ghat i mean so for rest of the i mean for most part of the year this is like you know all sand bank uh, the river gets very shallow and very narrow and then this all sand is revealed and this is what uh, buddhist literature says that buddha when his his uh, this horse landed it was very shining uh signing sand beach so this is the i mean this is the most uh, this is uh, i think this is the most uh, correct identification of anuma because i mean again if you see uh shrenzang and fashian both of them they say uh, they took uh, i mean shrenzang according to shrenzang the, the place where buddha arrived after crossing anuma it was 100 li So hundred li is like you know twenty twenty uh, to thirty kilometer, and uh, Fashian says four yojan. So four yojan is something like you know uh, again thirty to forty kilometers. So maybe it was dense forest. So uh, you 
there must be some like you know miscalculation by fashion but frenzan description is very accurate and he says 100 li and this is like you know exactly 100 li i mean it's it's like 25 uh, from ramagrama to this place is 25 kilometers and uh, 30 kilometers and from here to this place is like you know 24 25 kilometers so and frenzan says east and because you know this is all hills this is very dense forest and uh, hilly area so and again the hill starts here so this is the only very small window available here for crossing and entering this side for bullock carts to enter uh, into india from nepal since i mean this is hills they cannot cross this place this is hills they cannot this place they cannot cross at this area this place so only this area is conducive for a bullock cart or i mean a trade route i mean for carts and uh, a pack to cross so uh and i mean this is the only uh, wide river from after rama grama which which uh, like you know which fulfills all the description of uh, buddhist literature which mentions about uh, the description of anuma so uh, gandaki gandak river or narayani river which is uh, i mean nepali name so this is the uh, i mean uh, people in nepal they believe that i mean according to them uh, narayani is ancient anuma and i mean i also believe that because it fits the description of shrenzang and fashian and all of the buddhist literature this is the most mighty river and wide river in whole this stretch there are many small small rivulets but i mean they don't they don't fit uh, the description of uh, all the buddhist literature so uh, everybody i mean who whosoever i met uh, old people and people who were like you know who who have crossed themselves this uh, place they said that this is a very ancient route and uh, darua bari i mean this, this uh, thari ghat is the ancient place which according to them is uh, like you know ancient place and uh, uh, probably the most uh, suitable place for, where bodhisattva siddhartha must have crossed enter uh, river anuma and uh, crossed uh, river anuma so these are few pictures of river anuma and this is like you know this whole area uh, this whole area is uh, like you know full of uh, uh, still i mean these are the these are like you know this tall elephant grasses these are remains of uh, uh, maybe in ancient times before all these villages came up so this entire stretch must be full of such kind of elephant grasses and like you know water bodies small small water bodies created by river so and this is uh, i have reached anuma uh, gandak so these are the hills in the background himalayas and uh, you can see i mean so it was a month of july and uh, when i reached there it was still raining and like you know it was very cloudy so river was full of water so i mean but people said that uh, this water stays only for, for a couple of months then again it will dry and people will start i mean they they can walk and cross this river and this is thari ghat i mean it's still very popular ghat and uh, all the trade i mean all the people who want to do business from india they use same ghat now thari ghat is still it's very popular but one of the most important revelation was i found this uh, poster there near this uh, ghat this this uh, crossing point this uh, uh, i saw this uh, poster there and uh, when i spoke to local people they said that uh, some people some research scholar based in nepal the, according to them Uh, thari ghat is ancient anuma ghat the, according to them also i mean i was so happy i was so glad because it was my conviction that uh, uh, this place should be the place where bodhisattva siddhartha crossed uh, river anuma and i found some people who to believed in this thing and and they, they had they were they have already they were already uh, celebrating this like you know they have already put this poster there and uh, they are trying to make a temple there now Uh, so it is a very uh, nice that people i mean uh, nepali scholars also uh, they also think that uh, thari ghat is the uh, correct place based on the buddhist uh, description provided in the buddhist literature so again this is this is a, uh, this group of uh, people in this village so just by the river anuma there is a village called narsai so these are the people who are followers of the buddha i mean you can see buddha image in the background so uh, they welcomed me and i was their host for one year, one day and uh, uh, they are trying to revive this uh, anuma ghat thari ghat and they are trying to create a uh, temple there so and uh, uh, from them i learned that uh, people from i mean scholars from uh, 
Parsai and uh, Lumbini and Kapilavastu, they uh, keep coming and uh, they're trying to educate these people. And I mean, basically, they want to make this place as a tourist place, pilgrimage place. So this is a very welcome sign and uh, it's very good that uh, this place is getting revived. So the whole story is like, you know, the whole picture is that uh, this is Rama Grama. So the route taken was, I mean, according to local people. So uh, this route should be something like this, coming to this Thari Ghat. And this is Narsai village. This is where I, uh, I stayed uh, on my foot journey. So uh, when I spoke to the, the local fishermen and people, uh, old people here, so all of them uh, said that uh, people, I mean, they still cross and people in ancient times also 100 years ago, till uh, according to their power, their memory, people uh, crossed uh, Anuma at this place, Thari, uh, Thari Ghat. And this fits, uh, I mean, like, you know, because uh, I, according to me, Darua Badi is the place where Bodhisattva Siddhartha, after crossing uh, Anuma, he arrived at this place and I have discovered uh, ancient remains, uh, which I think are stupas. So... Mm. And I mean, I spoke to a few people and uh, there's a village here and uh, villagers, I mean, when they were digging earth, they found uh, some ancient remains here also. So it suggests that uh, uh, the, the route was something like this. And this, this entire area, I mean, this blue dot, it is ancient riverbed. I mean, rivers sometimes still, I mean, like, you know, uh, it changes course and sometimes it flows like this and sometimes it flows like this. But after creating this uh, dam here, they have channelized water. So now, I mean, no more, I mean, water sifts. I mean, there's no more change of uh, water course, but this, this entire area is uh, riverbed. So again, so, I mean, th this is so interesting that uh, this Darua Badi village where I found all those ancient stupa from second century uh, AD, uh, it is exactly, I mean, like, you know, where this ancient bed of uh, ancient river bed ends. So, uh, I'm convinced that uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha took this route and uh, he crossed uh, uh, Anuma from Thari Ghat. Then he, after, I mean, like, you know, he must have, I mean, this must be sand bank at the time of uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha. And uh, uh, so, and, and then he, uh, after landing at, I mean, after coming to this part, I mean, then uh, he spent some days here, he, he sent Chandaka back and then he cut his hair and then uh, he accepted ropes from uh, a hunter. So Shranzang mentions about three stupa. So two stupa I had discovered uh, in my previous journey. And again, after I did some exploration in this area, I found some more remains in this area. Uh, somewhere here, you know, this is forest. Uh, last time I, I mean, in my previous walk, I could not explore because I mean, at that time uh, it was, I mean, very damp and very, because it was a rainy season, it was very, uh, lots of vegetation. And this time also it was full of vegetation, but still, I mean, I went further inside and I again found uh, stupa structures inside this. But I could not do much study because I mean, it was uh, rainy season and it was uh, again flooded with water. I would again go to this place after, I mean, like, you know, this monsoon seasons are over and when this place gets dried up, I mean, when this uh, place is conducive for more exploration, but I think uh, I have discovered all the three stupas in this area. I mean, I'm convinced because I mean, two, I had already previously, I mean, my previous walk I discovered and one more, I discovered more, I, rem I discovered more remains, which I'm not sure whether they are stupa or some other, like, you know, monasteries or something. But they again, this the new structures which I have discovered in this area again they have the bricks are same, which are from these two mounts which I discovered last year. So, yeah. So again, I crossed Anuma and entered India because uh, I didn't took proper permission to enter Nepal. I didn't uh, had valid permission, so I had to again sneak inside India. So I convinced these boat people to drop me. I mean, to take me to the other, other side. Uh, so this is how I, I re-entered India. So again, I mean, like, you know, Buddhist literature talks about this two uh, great event uh, after Bodhisattva Siddhartha crossed Anuma river. So he cut his hair and he sent back uh, Chandaka. So these are very, uh, nicely. I mean, uh, they are depicted in, I mean, they have been there. This events finds mentioned in all the literature, including the travelogues of Shranzang and Fashian. So these are few, uh, depiction from uh, Buddhist literature, I mean, Chinese Buddhist literature, 
these are the line drawings uh, from ming period so th this uh, uh, this uh, images i mean they they depict these two great events and this is the stupa which i discovered last time not this time so i mean this time i mean because i mean i told you when i entered this forest it was full of water i mean i could not i mean i i i found it very difficult to even stand i mean like you know i was uh, knee deep in water and i could only see structures and bricks uh, everywhere uh, i could not measure it i could not uh, take proper pictures so maybe i will go again and uh, i will make some pictures i will put the story detail story in my blog uh, very soon but i think that i have uh, discovered the third stupa also uh so i mean uh, so we were aware of the fact that bodhisattva siddhartha from tilara kota he reached ramagrama so we were aware about this leg and then we were also we are also aware that i mean th this from lorya nandan ariraj kesariya and vesali this site i mean all these places running parallel to gandak river that is ancient anuma has got ashokan pillar so lorya nandan has got uh, ashokan pillar ariraj had got, has uh, ashokan pillar and kesariya has got this stupa at vesali of course it has an ashokan uh, stupa and ashokan pillar so this is an ancient trade route uh, running parallel to gandak river so we uh, this is uh, the route taken by buddha i mean uh, all the scholars believed in that so only thing which was missing was the connection from rama grama to lorya nandan gad so after discovery of i mean like you know after uh, i mean uh, like you know discovery of this anuma ghat thari ghat at this place at this place and uh, discovery of the stupas at this place by me so i am now convinced that this route should be something like this because again i uh, i uh, i visited this place and this place has got lots of stupa from uh, kusha i mean uh, second century ad so now i think this <clears throat> A route taken by the great renunciation trail of bodhisattva siddhartha and mahaprajapati gautami has been like you know it's complete and now the time has come to re revitalize this uh, trail ancient trail of uh, uh, something like you know for uh, <coughs> 350 kilometers so now coming to uh, i mean people were interested in knowing about the place where uh, mahaprajapati gautami attained uh, nirvana and where she got ordination so i want to just uh, share something about like you know this is ashokan pillar site of vesali so when it was discovered this ashokan pillar was like this you know it was uh, uh, a part of a mahant uh, it was part of a brahmanical compound complex and people were not aware about the significance of this ashokan pillar this pillar was uh, being mentioned as a, a walking stick of a legendary uh, i mean uh, mahabharat epic uh, person Mah bhim so this is locally known as bhim sen ki lathi i mean like walking stick of uh, bhim legendary bhim of mahabharat epic so based on shrenzang i mean it was only shrenzang description which said this ashokan pillar should be the place where uh, buddha accepted uh, honey from uh, monkeys so this is markat harda so based on shrenzang description this place was excavated and it was i mean like you know this whole place was uh, i mean like you know this whole this was this was like you no know, mound this was mound and this this house that you see here it was resting here so when they excavated based on shrenzang description so exactly i mean shrenzang description was i mean perfectly uh, you know highlighted here when they excavated they found this pillar and they found this ashokan stupa and other uh, subsidiary shrines which shrenzang mentions including this water tank so this is i mean after uh, excavation this is vesali ashokan pillar and uh, stupa and this uh, tank uh, created by monkeys so why i am talking about this is that all the ancient site mentioned by shrenzang were lost in uh, after 10th century it became mounds they be they became uh, <clears throat> they got converted into i mean like you know mounds and uh, all the significance was lost nobody was aware about the significance of all the places so <clears throat> this place was <clears throat> <clears throat> so this place was revealed on the basis of description of shrenzang so shrenzang has mentioned many other places in vesali including the place where mahaprajapati gautami attained nirvan and the place where mahaprajapati gautami and 500 shakan women they got ordained so 
this is the place where kolu this is the place where this is the place where uh, ashokan pillar this ashokan pillar site is here so shrenzang mentions this ashokan pillar site and close to this place he mentions about the relic body relic stupa of uh, uh, relic stupa over the body uh, relics of uh, buddha so this stupa was again discovered on the basis of shrenzang description there was a site here there was a mound when they excavated they found this uh, relic stupa there and they discovered relic uh, casket also so only these two sites were uh, excavated rest of the sites mentioned by shrenzang uh, all these sites are still mounds there are villages settled on that so indian archaeological survey they could not excavate these sites because uh, they did, because there were villages on this uh, uh, on this mounds so it was not conducive for them to i mean remove all these villages and to relocate them and excavate them but uh, my idea is my point is that uh, if based on shrenzang description if we can discover these two places which are exactly correct so according to shrenzang mahaprajapati got me attend nirvana somewhere here he he went to according to shrenzang the place where mahaprajapati got me attend nirvana this was uh, it was i mean uh, relative to this village uh, where he where there was a monastery and where shrenzang stayed so based on his description if you project you will find this village so this are the again i mean like you know uh, description of uh, mahapajapati going to buddha at that time uh, buddha was staying at uh, uh, double gallery vihara uh, and uh, uh, mahapajapati got me and 500 shakyam they arrived at vishali and then the uh, mahapajapati got me went to meet buddha but buddha was again like you know not uh, very like you know he was not uh, willing to uh, make an uh, bhikkhuni sangha so now i mean uh, then uh, mahapajapati got me met uh, ananda and then ananda venerable ananda uh, venerable ananda spoke with uh, he, he he mediated between mahapajapati got me and uh, buddha and finally uh, buddha was convinced with some additional rules and regulations so this event happened at double gallery vihara and this is again a very great uh, depiction of uh, the attainment of uh, mahaparinirvana uh, of uh, mahapajapati gotmi and 500 shakyam nuns so this is again depicted in uh, ming woodcuts a uh, 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 chinese text so these are the villages like you know so based on uh, my exploration in this area of, i have been i have visited this place multiple times so based on my exploration uh, so this is the place uh, where shrenzang there was a monastery here at the time of shrenzang and farshian so farshian when he came to fifth came in fifth century he also stayed in this monastery here so there is a village now and uh, shrenzang also stayed at this place so shrenzang mentions about the place where mahapajapati got me attend uh, nirvana it is it was like you know 1 to 2 km northeast of this place so based on this description you reach this place <coughs> village birpur so in village birpur there are lots of mounds like this you know but most of this mounds i mean there are there are few mounds which are surviving but many of the mounds have been damaged because people are ignorant about the significance of this they do not know what this mound represents so for, because there is a like you know they want they have converted many of these mounds they have broken those mounds and removed grove bricks and earth so the ancient remains have been lost i mean now they are flat structure but still i mean you can if you go to this village you will find some mounds low mounds and uh, if you do some exploration in this area you will find this place has got lots of ancient pottery uh, from ancient times like you know from the buddha's time so this place was a very active place uh, in the time of the buddha and after even after buddha's mahaparinirvana after 6th century also this place continued to remain relevant and i mean like you know important of some significance based on the ancient remains which you uh, which i have i discovered here and uh, shrenzang mentioned about mentions about double double gallery vihara so according to shrenzang the double gallery vihara was somewhere here it should be somewhere here so again i did exploration here and i also found some i mean uh, mounds and ancient remains in this village so both this village uh, where mahaprajapati got me got ordained 
the double the double gallery vihara it is it should be somewhere here and the place where uh, mahaprajapati got me in 500 shakyam women they attend uh, parinirvana so it, this place should be somewhere here so this whole area so though we have lost uh, the ancient remains we do not have stupa remains uh, as we i mean like you know assume like you know uh, like uh, we have stupa somehow this stupa survived in uh, this place i mean the kulhua people didn't damage it but i mean in this village uh, we have not excavated probably we may find some structure uh, under this places i mean under this mound but even if we don't find i mean uh, any significant mound uh, significant brick structure so still the significance of the place is not uh, like you know it's still very significant because according to shrenzang this is the area where uh, mahaprajapati got me attend parinirvana so the 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 structures are not important the sanctity is important so this place i mean it's not a very large area it's like you know two to two acres area here and two acre area here so it's not important to know exactly where the event happened because uh, mahaprajapati got me according to shrenzang uh, mahaprajapati got me and 500 nuns they used to stay here this was the village of amrapali so they were staying uh, near the, the the monastery was close to the place of um, amrapali uh, her village so this whole area i mean mahaprajapati got me and 500 shakyan women nuns they they lived here so this whole area is very sacred so uh, the idea is to revitalize these two places we should have some shrines here uh, i mean shrines comes and go i mean time and again people i mean kings and patrons they have recreated stupas they have re-erected memorials to Uh, celebrate the, this great legacy of uh, buddha and his prominent disciple and uh, stupas get lost i mean then kings come and they re they rebuild stupas and monasteries so again if even if we have lost uh, this uh, stupas and shrines at this the, at these two places uh, effort should be made to revitalize these two places i mean we should uh, again uh, uh, because i mean shrenzang is not wrong i mean if 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 shrenzang is correct for these two places so how can he be wrong for this to all these places it's all only that because all these places have villages now on the mounds and we have not explored it properly so we should not just like you know leave it i mean we should not uh, think that i mean these places dot do not exist and shrenzang is wrong shrenzang is correct but it's only that i mean time has changed and people are not aware about the significance of these places and in the process they have destroyed i mean they have reused the bricks they have reused the wood they have reused the i mean the ancient structures but the sanctity is still there so i mean one of the objective of this walk is to uh, sensitize people and uh, followers of the buddha all over the world about the sanctity about uh, of the place and uh, revitalize all these places these places were i mean important i mean uh, farshian visited these places shrenzang visited these places so this was part of the pilgrimage tradition all the monks and uh, nuns coming from all over the world who is to make pilgrimage to buddhist shrines so they would not just go to eight great places they would go to uh, this uh, smaller shrines related with uh, i mean uh, other important events related with buddha and uh, important event that took place in the uh, important events related with uh, prominent disciples like sariputta moglana uh, um, mahakashyapa ananda mahapajapati gautami uh, and uh, vishakha and other prominent people so idea of this uh, the reason why i took this food journey is to revitalize all these places these places are still neglected in spite of uh, we being aware about uh, these places for past 150 years when this uh, travelogs of shrenzangs were uh, uh, i mean when they were translated from chinese to french and from french to english so we are aware for last 150 years that mahapajapati got me and uh, and other important disciples and other places of significance of buddha uh, are somewhere here i mean in whole of the gangetic plain i mean not only vishali it's about uh, mishravasti it's about rajgir it's about bodhgaya all the places but i mean we are totally we, i mean all of us i mean it's uh, I mean, it's not just about government i mean even the devouts i mean the pilgrim pilgrims uh, there is no communication i mean people are i mean i don't blame anybody but i mean we are totally insensitive towards all these sacred places and the idea behind this walk is to uh, sensitize people that i mean all of us should come together and we have to revitalize all these places these places are very sacred and uh, uh, patrons and the kings and uh, i mean uh, pilgrims 
they kept all these places living heritage for more than 1500 years it's only after i mean 10th century when there was a change in the political climate in indian subcontinent that all these places were lost and pilgrimage was finished monasteries got abandoned so nobody was uh, there to take care of all these sites so but now that we are aware of all these things we should join hands in <coughs> now we should <coughs> sorry so now we should all of us should come together and revitalize all these places so as dr v was uh, talking uh, yeah so as dr v was mentioning that uh, we are making a documentary film about all these places and we are in the process uh, we are collecting funds we are like you know asking people who are interested in uh, creating this database this knowledge base i mean through films and publications so we are looking for collaborators and uh, so this is the complete trail i mean from tilarakota this is like you know 550 km trail so the renunciation of mahaprajapati got me from tilarakota it ends at vaishali but bodhisattva siddhartha uh, 11 years before the renunciation of uh, mahaprajapati got me so it it ended at uh, bodhya the ancient uruvela so it is like 550 km so now almost i mean like you know we are aware about the whole trail i mean uh, all the ar archaeological study and exploration have established that ancient route from vaishali to bodhgaya was i mean uh, which bodhisattva siddhartha took was something like you know from vaishali from vaishali he came to chechar and from chechar he came to nalanda and rajgir and this was the ancient route uh, which this is our best understanding uh, based on our um, the all the archaeological study and literary evidences so this is our best understanding of the uh, Uh, two great renunciation trails so besides that we are also interested in integrating the ancient uh, kapilavastu because there is lots of discussion about where is the kapilavastu i mean like you know because half of the kapilavastu is in india and half of the kapilavastu is in nepal so like you know india promotes its own kapilavastu and nepal promotes its own kapilavastu so basically you know this this is the very new border i mean you can see at the piprava the indian side of kapilavastu i mean which is being promoted as indian kapilavastu it's very close to like you know lumbini it's like you know 20 kilometers from lumbini and only like you know again aerial distance from tilarakot is again 18 to 19 kilometers so it was ancient kapilavastu was something like this which is like you know divided by this border so based on uh, archaeological evidence we know that uh, piprava is the site where uh, uh, shakyan people they created their main monastery the central monastery which is called maha kapilavastu monastery and they enshrined the buddha buddha's body relic at this place so this was very equally important place and this was tilarakota is the place where uh, the palace city where bodhisattva siddhartha spent his childhood uh, <clears throat> and uh, so and there must have existed some route uh, connecting these two places piprava and tilarakota so on my foot journey uh, this was another imp important objective i mean my objective was also to integrate this two place and we should have like you know some uh, uh, every year we should have some event to connect these two places through some walking trails some like you know some uh, walking event some cycling event so uh, and now the time has come to revive this uh, not only integrate this to kapilavastu but also to revive this ancient trail of uh, two grand uh, an ancient trail Uh, following the two great initiation of uh, buddha and the mahaprajapati got me so i mean uh, on my food journey i met some uh, very uh, wonderful people who encouraged me and they are also i mean when i discussed about the revitalization of this trail so all of them they they were very positive and they uh, they are also i mean in, uh, in nepal side they are also planning something i mean they are aware about these things and so they are also planning some events especially <clears throat> bikram ji i mean he 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 is starting next year he is planning to initiate a cycling i mean to promote this pilgrimage to promote the renunciation trail of mahaprajapati got me from next year he is planning to start a cycling trail you know from tilara kota to anoma river ghat i mean this is like you know 112 km trail so i mean he is planning for three day cycling tour for girls Uh, so that i mean uh, people get to know about people are aware about uh, the great initiation of bodhisattva siddhartha but uh, uh, very few people are aware about the uh, initiation of mahaprajapati gotmi and 500 shakyan women which was equally inspiring which was like you know as dr v said uh, it was uh, it uh, it uh, it was for the first time something like that happened i mean 500 uh, uh, girls women they left uh, and barefooted they walked 
through the jungles and crossed rivers and this must be like you know 15 days journey on foot uh, from tilara kota to veshali so uh, in order to promote and create awareness vikram uh, uh, ji with his uh, partners he is trying to he, he would be uh, organizing a cycling tour and maybe uh, from indian side also maybe something will come up and then we can have the complete uh, renunciation trail and this is also important like you know uh, uh, on my foot journey i met many people and uh, everybody is aware about buddha and uh, i mean important things associated with buddha but people are not aware about the details associated with uh, i mean mahapajapati got me and uh, and people want to know when i i mean like you know uh, this is group of uh, buddhist people whom i met at uh, narsahi uh near anuma river and uh, these are few uh, gurung uh, tribal uh, upasikas buddhist uh, followers and i i uh, on my foot journey i met them in their monastery uh, the, the, there is a temple in bhairava so i met them and uh, when i told them that i am following the footsteps of i am following the trail of mahapajapati got me in, uh, and So Mahapajapati got me, and five hundred Shakyamuni women must have crossed this place, Bhairava, on her on her journey to uh, Vaishali. So they got very excited, and they told me that uh, they were never aware about that. I mean, nobody told them. This is not being to, uh, told in their textbooks. Nobody has ever told them that. I mean, uh, there is something called the renunciation of Mahapajapati got me also. So there's there's a uh, lots of uh, I mean there's lots of uh, what do you say people are curious to know more about uh, buddhist history and uh, this great uh, pilgrimage and all these great events that took place in the life of buddha and other prominent disciple but we do not have means to tell them the stories and uh, uh, and if uh, these people they get to know about all these uh, things so i mean uh, it would be easy to revive uh, revitalize all these places which are currently neglected so this is why i mean uh, uh, i have thought about making documentary series uh, on uh, all the sites and especially giving focus on the st- uh, stories told by shrenzang because shrenzang witnessed all those events i mean all those uh, tradition they when he went to like you know all the places he was told what happened here so these are the i mean uh, shrenzang mentions tradition so the documentary series which i am planning which my team is uh, now, uh, live, now we are conceiving and we have already ready with the scripts so what uh, we are now focusing on is uh, reviving the legacy or not only the pilgrimage but also the shrenzang accounts like you know we take i mean we, we, when we go to all these places we take it for granted that this places and all this awareness is existing forever i mean for, for from like you know very past times i mean we, we are not aware of this fact that we know all these things because of shrenzang it's uh, shrenzang description uh, which uh, brings uh, all this uh, places to life you know it's only his description which has led to their discovery and all the details most of the details about the smaller shrines like if you go to bodh gaya so uh, how this temple came into being and all those seven great uh, play, uh, like you know the seven weeks where buddha spent seven weeks so all those uh, places is mentioned by shrenzang i mean in detail so uh, the documentary series that we are i mean uh, which we are now uh, working on i mean like you know we are working we have already prepared the script we are uh, ready with the like you know the details so it is basically focusing on the elaborate f- f- footsteps of the buddha pilgrimage mentioned by shrenzang so we are hoping to find some partners some like you know collaborator who is interested in reviving that legacy of buddha and shrenzang also like you know we should not forget it because most of the time generally we, we, we in india we are being told that shrenzang is a tra- he was a traveler who came to india and after reading shrenzang travelog and after walking all this uh, places i realized he was not an ordinary traveler he was like you know uh, he was a great extraordinary being and uh, uh, all our awareness about the footsteps of the buddha pilgrimage the buddhist geography is i mean single handedly it is uh, based on shrenzang description so people should be aware about this fact and we should like you know uh, we should have gratitude towards this extraordinary person so this is all i have to say and i would request i mean if anybody is interested i mean please contact us i mean you can contact through dr v also so dr v that's all i have to say thank you okay thank you very much uh, deepak wonderful presentation 
and you have actually given the spirit of venture to all of us. I must say that uh, please, uh, our um, you know audience today, we we'll encourage you to click uh, like on the Facebook and comment, and we can certainly take questions. Uh, for us to spot the questions, please put a queue, and before you ask the questions, and we have brother Bobby. Uh, we will be transmitting the we are doing actually on two platforms uh Deepak and myself uh, we are on zoom and uh, you are watching the uh, transmission on uh, facebook so you can put your questions on facebook and then it will be communicated to us and we can ask Deepak the question so it is very interesting and i must also mention that tonight we have uh, bikram g who is a uh, radio nepal uh, radio tourism nepal uh, in which was mentioned by Deepak, and he's 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 here tonight. All uh, he's on Zoom, so we might want to hear a little bit of what he has to say. Uh, you know, uh, you know, based on the presentation. Actually, some of the things that I picked up from uh, from uh, Deepak's uh, presentation. Actually, I thought there was only two stupas. No, Deepak is saying there are three stupas in the vicinity of Anoma. That is wonderful. So, and uh, the distance from Kapilavastu to Vishal was about three hundred. And 50 kilometers, is that right, Deepak? It's 300, 300 plus kilometers. Oh, 300 plus kilometers. So could you imagine, could you actually imagine that the nuns, 500 second ladies, they're all from the nobility, you know, wife of princes and all that. They were so inspired by the Dhamma that they decided to renounce and walk barefooted. Palace ladies walking over 300, over kilometers, you know, with the journey that which could take 50, 15 to 20 days, depending on the weather condition, it was remarkable. And eventually when they stood at a hall where the Buddha was, the Buddha was staying, and they were just crying. They didn't know whether or not the Buddha would agree to that. They've taken so much trouble just in order to become nuns, right? So that is that is actually a very moving story. And the, the, the presentation which um, uh, Deepak mentioned, that there was this Bir Birpur and Udayapur, which could be the places where Pajapati and the 500 women actually uh, nuns lived. Uh, this is according to the accounts of Sanjang, but we know that uh, 2,600 years ago is a long time. So villages would have been built over many of these structures. The structures have been gone. You know, people have completely forgotten what, what these places were meant to be. And also in the case of Vaishali, where so many things are there, when we go to Vaishali for pilgrimage, you know, uh, you just go to one or a few places. Yeah? which is identified and after we move on. But around Vaishali, is that there are so many places, many of them still underground and unexcavated. And you know, during the Buddhist time, Vaishali was a thriving trade, trade center, you know, where the crossroads, trade routes were so part through. But then because of the flooding of the river and all that, the city was almost abandoned, you know, almost like the way, uh, you know, uh, Savati was, during the time of King Pasinadi and right now, it's very, very different. So Vishali was like that. It was all because of the flooding and all, it was almost abundant. And if not for the accounts of uh, Shuan Chang, we would not even, even have Vishali. And I think the nice thing about the map, <coughs> even as the trail, um, uh, Deepak, is that suddenly, suddenly, all these places are interlinked. You know, we actually can see right up from uh, Tilarakot right down to uh, to to Bodh Gaya because when you travel in buses you just travel based on the roads that we have right now but not based on this this ancient route trade routes that was being used in the past so this is almost like reawakening the interest that uh you know sometimes when you go on a bus you don't see how these places are all connected uh this is really quite wonderful he also mentioned about sometimes there is this controversy about uh, where is Kapilavastu? Is it in India or Nepal? But actually, it is one big city. But also during the Buddhist time, I think about two years before the Buddha passed away, the whole city of uh, Kapilavastu was burned down to the ground. <laughs> was burned to the ground, and the Sakins were massacred. So later on, the Buddha's remains were actually put at um, uh, Priprawa, uh, the great monastery. And also, uh, he was mentioning about uh, Sri Bikramji, who is actually going to start this uh, cycling trail and all that. It sounds so interesting. You know, things are just awakening, you know, as people begin to discover a lot of things, a lot of enthusiasm is coming in. Now, I must also say that we might be actually running past our time. Is it okay with the rest of you? Because it looks as if, uh, you know, there might be some questions coming in and all that. But maybe uh, let me just give the space to 
uh, Bikramji. Uh, Bikramji, do you like to say something? Oh, sure, Victor. Okay. It's an honor. Like you said, I was touched by your one word or sentence, the real awakening. Okay? okay. So whatever you are doing, Deepakji is doing, and we are all doing is a, is a awakening. Because with China included, there are thousand million Buddhist to, uh, you know, people uh, along Asia and, you know, European belt or Eurasia belt. So thousand million means this is a thousand million people market in the sense that they all want to visit Buddha's place once in their lifetime before they die. So this is a spiritual awakening, if you like, Victor. In your, in your own world. Mm -hmm. So what is so impressive for the rest of the people of the world, Buddhist or non-Buddhist, is what you are doing and what Deepak is doing, retracing those historic roots. Now, retracing not necessarily always means only to protect or to save it as a heritage, but to convert it live for small, small economic activities. Okay? Small, small activities along this Buddha's route or Wenshang route or Emperor Asoka route. You know, they all travel through the same route before. And now these routes are going to be the real route connecting with, you know, less fortunate rural areas with small, small economic activities, which will be a sustainable activities. And Buddhist tourism is going to address this economic growth between India and Nepal, step by step. So I call it, Victor, Buddha plus economics. So I call it Buddhonomics, which gives you sustainable life, sustainable pleasure, sustainable, you know, supreme happiness and sustainable management of your economy at, at home. When you are strong and when you have a strength at your own courtyard or own home, economically, without debt, I think this is the miracle of Buddhonomics. Okay, so okay. progress should not be judged always in the name of GDP growth. Progress can also be interpreted. The mass happiness, the mass sustainable freedom, you know, they are standing on their own feet with their own indigenous knowledge and local skills to develop something for the economic economic upliftment. This is what Bikram is working for, using all these heritage, Buddha's message, and all these, you know, uh, places of Buddha's life, like Tilarakot Palace, Lumini, Baisali, Bodh Gaya, Radgir, Nalanda, all connected, you know, Kushinara, Sankasya, you know, all connected. One is spiritual side, another is economic upliftment for the local people. And this is going to bring beautiful result, money with happiness. Okay? And there is going to be a mountain bike trip next year because, Victor, I am already running great Buddhist trail, a mountain bike, a spiritual mountain bike adventure from a place called uh, Monkey Temple. And mm. that is the birthplace of Neva civilization. Neva means the local, local Nevari people. They call themselves as Neva. So that is the birthplace of Neva civilization and connecting with Sakya civilization in Lumine Kapil Vastu. And this is also for economic activities, uplifting the local people uh, uh, you know, not connected by government, you know, spending or budget, but connected by Buddha's good message and local upliftment of local people by economic activities. So this is going to bring some result and we're going to call it Buddhonomics. Okay, thank you very much, you. Uh, Vikram Ji, you for your intervention. So what the Vikram Ji was actually mentioning about is that thank you. when this... Uh, when the when this uh, pilgrimage uh, uh, become Jay, can, could you just uh, mute your your microphone? Yeah, because there is some kind of feedback. Yes, uh, when these trails are opened, it will actually bring a lot of good benefits to the local population. Because very often when we talk about tour tourism, it, only the big companies are the ones that benefit from it, and the companies could be operating from Delhi. 
But when you undergo this trail, you're actually touching the lives of the local people, right? And uh, and there is also the kind of involvement of the local people into this project. And you will be bringing countries together. China, with a huge Buddhist population, the largest in the world, actually, China. And uh, India, because they're interlinked to, the, to, uh, to this pilgrimage, together with Nepal. So what a wonderful way of connecting uh, countries together. Now, there are some questions here. Uh, are the information found and collected, uh, uh, being compiled and recorded? Uh, where can one who is interested follow the discoveries? Thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, this, um, uh, the BJ yeah, but... also says the first phrase, but maybe uh, Deepak Anand, would you like to just comment on that? Uh, Bikram Ji, your, could you just mute your... Yeah. Ah, very yeah, good. So, yeah, Dr. V, I mean, I have blog and all my stories, I mean, related to walks. I mean, Nepal walk stories are still not online. I mean, I'm still working on those stories. But I mean, very soon, I mean, uh, two of the stories from Nepal walk is coming, going to get online. But I mean, most of the discoveries, I mean, most of the stories, I have more than 38 stories uh, already on my blog regarding I mean, all the uh, earlier walks. Mm. So, but now the time has come because I mean, the, nowadays people they don't read much, you know, they want to see films, you know. <laughs> so, I, mean, it should be, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if the, because I mean, I, I cannot condense the stories to, I mean, like, you know, I mean, because there's so much of description of Shenzhang, and I mean, there's there are layers of history. And I mean, I try my best to keep it short, but I mean, it's not possible. I mean, this is so much of history and so much of layers. So now, I mean, uh, this is why, I mean, we are talking about making films, I mean, short, short films, I mean, talking about significance. And most importantly, like, you know, the focus is on revitalization of the places and the great legacy of Shrenzang. This guy, I mean, Shrenzang Bodhisattva, he deserves, I mean, standing ovation from everybody who goes to Buddhist pilgrimage. He should be aware from back of his mind. He should know that basically he's following the footsteps of Shrenzang, Master Shrenzang. So this is the idea behind this whole series. I mean, Shrenzang, this is why I didn't call it in the footsteps of the Buddha pilgrimage foot journey. It's in the master's footsteps. Because Buddha pilgrimage, what we have now is basically footsteps of the Bodhisattva Siddhartha, uh, Bodhisattva Shrenzang. So this whole web series would be highlighting the uh, foot journey of Shrenzang. I mean, his, his pilgrimage. What we are going to produce is basically Shrenzang's pilgrimage, told from our angle, from our side, you know, how we see it. Yeah, this is wonderful, uh, 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 Deepak. I think uh, this is also the century for Sun Zhang. You know, mm -hmm. even in China itself, among the Chinese, they didn't know who Sun Zhang is, despite mm -hmm. the fact of his huge contribution. Because later on, 1,000 years after Sun Zhang left, uh, they came out with a, with a fiction that is based on his journey. And the Chinese knows this very, very well. This is about the story of the monkey and the, and the monk on his white horse which was supposed to be Sun Zhang is a, a very, uh, you know, indecisive and, you know, uh, you know, whereas the hero was really the monkey. Yeah. That is not the depiction of what we know Sun Zhang is. Sun Zhang is a really tough guy. Uh, yeah. He's a towering in terms of intellect. In Nalanda, he was one of the 10, you could say, you know, top professors of, of Nalanda. So, so, yeah. and he was also chosen to debate, you know, yeah. so, the Chinese are now awakening to who is the real Shenzhang now, now with all these things. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to add just one thing. Yeah. Shenzhang, he was such a humble guy. He was such a humble person. So he had such a high opinion about Nalanda yeah. that when he left China, so he thought, I mean, entering into, he didn't want to miss entering into Nalanda University, you know. So all his, on his way, wherever he met good professors about Sanskrit, logic and uh, grammar, and uh, Buddhist philosophy. So he stayed in all those monasteries just to perfect himself. But when he arrived at Nalanda, he realized that, I mean, he knows, I mean, he's better than, I mean, most of them. I mean, like, you know, so when there was a debate organized by this uh, the King Hashwardhan in Kannauj, so all these monasteries and all this sex and tradition of Buddhism and other, I mean, like, you know, Brahminical tradition and Jain tradition. So Hashwardhana asked that all of you come and, and let's have a debate. So Nalanda University sent Shwenzang. I mean, he was the representative of Nalanda. And when this debate happened, when Shwenzang presented his paper, so, I mean, Harshwadana said, I mean, you will be given some days, seven or 10 days. I mean, his paper would be pasted here. If anybody has got any queries, I mean, they can come and debate with him. Nobody turned up. 
So Shenzhen, there was nobody willing to debate with Shenzhen because you know everybody knew that he, he, everybody in India at that time got aware that this his master. So Shenzhen was really very extraordinary guy who didn't knew how I mean how intellect intelligent and how I mean like you know how good he was in Buddhist philosophy and teachings. Yeah, actually, Sun Chang, he, he's got an incredible memory. Apparently, when he was he was still a child, below the age of ten, he will yeah. look at the sutra once and look at it again and close the sutra, and he could actually recite from start to the end. So that is the person you're talking about. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. He's so meticulous. Like when you visit a place, what do we do nowadays? We take our handphone and take pictures, right? <laughs> but Sun Chang will take a note of the size, the building, how tall it is, where it is positioned, yeah. facing which direction. And he will record this in great detail without even knowing that if it's going to be published somewhere. You know, so when he returned back to China, Xi'an, he was supposed to have a short meeting with, with Tai Zhong, which is the, the, the emperor. Now, you don't spend lots of time with the emperor. You just say the emperor, emperor just want to see who is the monk that have gone through the sea road and come back. And then when they started talking, his knowledge was like an encyclopedia. Tai Zhong was so caught up with him and spent the whole day. And then he said, okay, good, good, good. I want you as my advisor because <laughs> Tai Zhong wanted to expand into the Western region. And yeah. he says, no emperor, I come back with all the scriptures and I have to translate. But how do you say no to an emperor? So he promised the emperor that he will write a record, which he has made detailed notes. And that is what you have, the great Tang record of the Western region. Yes, Deepak, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing that when he arrived at Xi'an, so uh, at that time, he was supposed to meet uh, Taizong at Xi'an. But I mean, like, you know, by that time, Xuanzang reached uh, Xi'an, King had already moved to Luang, the, the, close to uh, Korea. I mean, they were about to attack Korea. So Shenzhen had to travel all 700 kilometers overnight. I mean, he, he could not, he didn't get time to rest at Xi'an. He was, he kept riding horse. So when he arrived at Xi'an, this uh, Luang, so somebody went into the tent of Taizong and said that, I mean, that monk has come. I mean, that uh, monk who left without your permission, he is back, he is here. So he said, I mean, send him. So when he entered this tent and when they, they, as you said, I mean, when they started discussing, I mean, he had only 15 minutes, but discussion got so interesting that he forget that there's an army waiting for his command. I mean, his order to attack uh, Korea, you know, <laughs> so they kept talking, talking. So this general who was, I mean, who was pissed off, like what's going on inside? I mean, the whole army is standing and waiting to take orders. So, I mean, he went inside and say that your oh, army is standing. So King said, come on, get out. I mean, this is time to, I mean, I'm busy with some other interesting thing. So that was the charm of Shenzhen. I mean, like, you know, a king is busy with him <laughs> and war is at kept at hold. Yeah. <laughs> okay, excellent, uh, uh, Deepak. Um, there is somebody who says, is there going to be visits uh, to the new discovery sites, uh, walking, walking, I think uh, for some short walking trails we do, uh, Deepak has got some walking trails, but I think at this, at this juncture, we have not got a walking trail all the way from Kapilabas to the Vishali, no, <laughs> not yet, not yet. <laughs> we can do, I mean, like, you know, ceremonial walk for one or two kilometers, then we can take cycles or motorcycle, I mean, people <laughs> who, can, who can ride bike, who can bike, ride, ride bicycle, who can take bus, who can take car, but the idea is to like, you know, mindfully take this trail. Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, so I think, uh, you know, as far as questions are concerned, everybody must be, you know, uh, completely taken up by the talk and there doesn't seem to be much questions this, uh, this evening. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, our time is up. I must actually, uh, give thanks to Deepak for appearing in our, uh, BGF program, uh, for, uh, for the fourth time. And this time she talking us about the great trail, you know, all the way from Kapilavastu, all the way down to Vishali, and from Vishali even leading on to the trail to Abud Gaya, uh, you know, where the Buddha actually walked and, you know, moved from time to time until he found Abud Gaya where he got enlightened. So um, I think if when you listen to this talk, you suddenly discover that there's so much more things that we don't know. And uh, the other thing is that how wonderful that we have Sun Chang's record. Not for Sanchez record, where do you go for pilgrimage? Uh, it's really wonderful. So thank you so much, Deepak. Thank you. It's lovely having you back again. And thank you, Bikram Ji, for being here. In fact, Bikram Ji is from the Radio Tourism Nepal, which is actually transmitting this, this entire talk, uh, not only in Nepal, but also internationally. So thank you so much. And I'd like to thank all of you 
together with the uh, societies that are been uh, uh, joining the cross broadcast with with PGF. Thank you all of you for participating in this uh, in this talk. And this is certainly uh, you know we're still going to explore further further travels along this trail because this is called the discovery the discovery talk. All right, with that I'd like to wish all of you uh, good night. Thank you so much. Uh, good night, but those of you on the other side of the globe could be good morning. <laughs> those from Brazil and all that, good morning. So with that, all of you, yeah, it's good night and uh, and uh, may peace, um, happiness uh, be with you, and may you and your loved ones keep safe during this uh, during these times. Good night. <laughs>